So, if you've been watching my channel for a while, you'll know this already, but if not, here's the condensed version. I largely stopped buying clothes about four years ago in favor of making my own. However, I have a small self-control problem, and I keep making fun, costumey, impractical clothes, which has really delayed my progress in transitioning my actual wardrobe to handmade stuff. Then, at a time when a lot of what I had was starting to look pretty old and shabby, I took about eight months off from sewing my own wardrobe to focus on sewing my wedding dress and my bridesmaid dresses, and then get married, and then move, and then bird problems. Yeah, so. <laughs> The current state of my wardrobe is not like a dire emergency, let's be serious, but it does need some attention. And now, using the principles I laid out in my 8 steps video, I'm going to strategize how I can most efficiently refresh my wardrobe and then plan a number of reasonably simple to sew, practical daily wear pieces that focus on using up fabric I already own. All right, here's what I'm working with. I've mentioned my measurements before, but it's a good reference if you want to compare your measurements when I'm talking about what styles do and don't work for me. I am five foot four with a 35 inch bust, a 28 inch waist, and a 38 inch hip. I have a pear-shaped body, which means I have a greater distribution of fat below my waist. I've also recently been looking into kibby body types and I'm not an expert, but my best guess is that I'm a pure gamine. And the third factor that I need to consider is my torso length. It's quite short, and definitely the most challenging aspect of my body type. It's also the factor that used to bother me the most, as I felt like no matter how thin I actually was, my torso always just looked so squat and dumpy. I'm older now, and realize that it's not a thing I can physically actually change. I have a skeleton in the way. But what I can do is dress in a way that gives me the confidence of knowing that I look my best, and that's what I'm trying to plan for today. So of these three factors, let's look at what styles are recommended for each. The key is always to try and balance out your proportions. With pear-shaped bodies, you can do this by using bright colors and prints on top to draw the eye up. You can use dark colors on your bottom half to minimize the attention it draws. You can choose tops with ruffles or embellishments. You can use large or flared or puffed or off-shoulder sleeves to increase the width of your shoulders. Flared skirts are great, as they emphasize the narrow point of your waist and feather out loosely across your hips. Straight panel skirts are going to be the worst because of how much bulk and mass is getting gathered right on top of your hips, but pleating instead of gathering can help with that. Fit and flare dresses provide balance because they show your smallness on top while minimizing and hiding your largeness on bottom. An opposite approach is to wear fitted pants on bottom and a loose top which will provide balance by increasing the visual mass of your upper half instead. For a kibigamine, there are a lot of recommendations and elements considered, some of which I won't mention because I feel like the system is weird and pushy about linking your personality to your body type. Things like, your pointed features give you an imp-like essence, so you should wear bold colors and fun prints to express your youthful and sassy personality. <laughs> I'm, I'm exaggerating a little, but I just, I don't like it. <laughs> Okay, aside from that qualm, the Kibi system does have quite a lot to offer. With a gamine, the focus is on structured, tailored pieces made from crisp or full-bodied fabrics. Color blocking is good to break up your horizontal lines. Monochromatic outfits are not very flattering. Skirts are recommended to be flared or A-lined and rather short. And small details are good, but they should be textured or sharp. So little collars, piping, buttons, color blocked patterns, geometric elements, cuffs, and stuff like that. Not a lot of fluff and delicacy and lace and chiffon. And lastly, a lot of kibby is focused on whether you are angled or soft, and recommends angles or curved lines to match. The pure gamine is an even split, and benefits from mixing dainty feminine elements with harder, more masculine elements. Now, I'm not completely sure of the logic behind some of these recommendations, but what I was excited to notice was how many of these elements I already gravitated towards. Then there is the third factor, the short torso, long-legged body type. In sewing terms, short-waisted. This is the most challenging aspect, but I recently found a YouTuber called Jules Beth, who discusses the short torso body type as that is what she has. Her style is more modern and mainstream than mine, but some of yours probably is too. So if you've got a similar body type, you should check her out. The main thing I learned from her is that the key is, again, balancing out your proportions. To do this, a lot of regular fashion advice is backwards. For example, chopping up the horizontal lines below your waist helps to visually shorten your legs. 
Things like cropped pants, short or mid-length skirts, taller boots, all of that will help. Or you can balance your proportions by doing the opposite, by visually lengthening your top half. To do that, you'll want higher necklines. Collared tops, halter tops, turtlenecks, boat necks, tops with the shoulders cut inward. All of those things are going to give you a longer vertical line above the waist. In contrast, a low neckline is likely to create the illusion that you are much shorter and wider than you actually are, which is what always bothered me about my appearance. I just didn't understand why. <laughs> Now, a short-waisted person can wear a low neckline, however, it's much better if the waist is de-emphasized, invisible, or dropped. You need to be careful about what you do with the minimal space between your waistline and your underbust. You can use narrow belts, or color-matched belts, or avoid belts entirely. If you have a large or even a moderately large bust, then the classic tucked-in blouse is just not going to work very well. Unless the blouse is very fitted, it's always going to loosen up under the bust and create the illusion of a big drooping mono boob. Here are three cards with these recommendations summarized. Keep in mind that I've condensed them to the tips that work best with my pre-existing preferences. They are not all-encompassing. Like, I ignored most tips for styling pants because I never wear them. I'm flashing them now, so here's your chance to take a screenshot if you also like these tips. Audrey Hepburn is the go-to example of the vintage gamine archetype. However, there is a modern equivalent who is just as memorable to me. <laughs> I want to take a few minutes of this video to analyze someone who perfectly exemplifies a short-waisted gamine. Doctor Who's Clara Oswald, played by Jenna Coleman. Granted, Clara is a character, not a person, with a professional costumer coming up with these outfits, and a TV wardrobe budget, and a seamstress tailoring the pieces to best suit her. But that doesn't mean we can't learn from her. I always loved and gravitated towards Clara's style, but only through learning about kibby body types and short-waisted style principles have I come to realize why. Clara's outfits were so iconic to me because subconsciously I could tell that this is me. This is my type, and it's my type done so well that people are still talking about it a decade later. So, here we go. First outfit, episode 6. Comfy, casual fit and flare dress with a crew neck, paired with chunky boots, and a geometric eagle necklace. Later she adds a draped cardigan, which further de-emphasizes the waist. Second outfit, episode 7. A gathered, feminine dress with a dropped waistline and a geometric print. Same boots and necklace, pop of color bag, Biker jacket with a lot of hard lines to contrast the softness of the dress. Episode 9. Short, dainty dress with a floral print and a low neckline. Why does it still work? The dress has princess seams and an invisible waistline. The dress is paired with a structured, square-shouldered blazer and simple dainty wedges. Episode 10. Her iconic red dress. A basic fit and flare dress, short with a high neckline, a de-emphasized waist, and sleeves puffed out with a bit of padding. The original dress did not have a square collar, the costumers added it to further raise the neckline. And it also looks as though they shortened the sleeves to right about level with her bust line. This dress hits it out of the park. They even managed to emphasize her vertical line with the collar and her shoulder width with the little puffs in the same dress. The dress is paired with chunky boots. Notice that they're tan and that this is the first time she's not been wearing black tights. They're making a firm choice to emphasize the length of her top half instead of chopping up and minimizing her long legs. Episode 12. A short, A-line skirt with a bold floral print and a zipper up the front. Really blending those dainty and hard elements. She's wearing it with a sweater with a matching knit Peter Pan collar, and over top of that, she has her denim biker jacket again, but zipped up. Again, it's paired with simple, dainty wedges. Episode 13. Peak Gamine. A wool tartan dress. Sturdy fabrics, geometric design, perfect tailoring. It is short, and they definitely shortened the original dress for her. The waist is de-emphasized through perfect pattern matching, and notice the princess seams. They've been squared off over the bust, and the tartan weave is rotated for the side panels. It just perfectly fits that bill of sharpness. There are welt pockets, a squared little collar, and short, smooth sleeves. It's just perfection. It's paired with classy leather wedges and a whimsical sleeping mouse necklace. I actually have a reproduction of this necklace and it is just the coolest and cutest little thing. I paid a lot of money for it and I was like, if I'm gonna buy this, I'm gonna wear it every day. Then there's the 50th anniversary special. A dainty floral dress paired with a stiff motorcycle jacket. The waist is cinched in with a wide belt, but the jacket is loose enough above and below it to create a good hourglass effect. It's fine overall, but not my particular favorite. Christmas episode. 
A dainty blouse with a lace collar paired with a fitted, smooth tartan wrapped skirt. Dainty and edgy once again. Over top of that, she wears a cardigan with a bow pattern woven into it. She wears tall boots with metal bits and a spiky necklace. And then there's a second banger of an outfit in the same episode. A short leather A-line skirt with a well-fitting sweater. The sweater is short enough to stay untucked, dropping her waistline, and it has a leather collar. It's glorious. It's so simple, but I love this one so much. And that's only the first season. She has many more bangers in the following two seasons, but her style continues to rely on a core silhouette of short, A-line skirts and collared tops. I think that finding your core, finding that central formula for yourself is key. You aren't limiting your wardrobe to just that, and you can build plenty of variations outside of the margins. But having a core silhouette that looks great on you, fits your preferences, and is comfortable and practical for your lifestyle, that is your foundation. Sorry, I just like, I just edited so much of this script that I had to re-record a whole chunk. And I, and I trimmed my bangs too short. <laughs> <clears throat> it's one thing to point out the details of styling done right, or to try and understand why it works, but it's another thing to take all of these random, sometimes contradictory tips and to implement them correctly for myself, without just copy and pasting someone else's style, which I've done in the past. I've been trying to make it make sense, probably for years now, I've taken pages and pages of notes, I've drawn sketches, I've made flowcharts at 3am, all in an effort to organize the recommendations for these three factors into something cohesive enough for me to actually utilize strategically. I've been considering what I actually wear, what I'm comfortable in, the critiques I have for the clothing currently in my wardrobe, and where I'm willing to try something new. It's entirely possible that I'm going overboard with this, but here's the thing. I have wasted so much time and so much money making clothes that I didn't end up liking. It's easy when you can go buy a cheap fast fashion garment. It's low risk. If you don't like it, you can just shrug, donate it, and buy something else without thinking any deeper. But that mentality has not worked very well for me in sewing. I need to be intentional because I'm tired of being disappointed with my projects. In order for this whole thing to be worth it, I need the results to be better than what I could just go buy. That's why this video is so important to me. If I can crack the code of why I like or don't like the way I look in a garment, then I'll be able to apply that knowledge to future projects and alter my designs before I start sewing, drastically increasing the likelihood that I'll actually like them. Here's what I've discovered in the simplest form that I've boiled everything down to. My core silhouette is fit and flare. I already sort of knew that, but this has definitely reaffirmed it for me. Because of my stature and torso proportions, I feel better presenting myself as petite by highlighting my smaller top half with good fitting and by covering my wider lower half with full skirts. This is my preference, how I feel best. I don't care what body type currently is or isn't in fashion. I've realized that the success of every fit and flare garment I make is going to boil down to three essential design elements, the neckline, the hemline, and the sleeves. Let's look at the neckline first. I recognize that high necks are the most flattering on me, but I also like wearing low necklines in the summer. If I decide to make a low neck garment, I'll need to pay attention to balancing the other parts of it. The waistline needs to be de-emphasized, the sleeves need to be designed appropriately, the hemline needs to drop proportionally, and I'll need to pay attention to how much width the sleeves are giving me compared to the length. This dress is a perfect example of everything done slightly wrong, but the sum of those small mistakes killing the effect. So when I go to start a project, the neckline is the first thing that I need to consider, because everything else is going to depend on it. Now, the second most important factor is the hemline. For practical reasons, I prefer hems to be no shorter than fingertip length and no longer than mid-calf length. Any shorter and I get more paranoid with every gust of wind. Any longer and stairs become problematic. Plus, that hem's going to have chicken poop on it, just watch. My favorite length is right just at the base of my knees but I shouldn't just make everything to that length. Instead, the hem of my skirts should be balanced against the neckline that they'll be paired with, and the color scheme of my outfit. That's why I didn't care for this jumper dress. It just has too much of the same pattern going down the length of my body. If I go back and hem it shorter, I guarantee it's going to start getting worn again. To summarize, a higher neckline needs a shorter hem to balance it, and lower necklines need a longer hem. A low neckline with a short skirt squishes and compresses me. It's not just unflattering, it looks childish. On the other hand, a high neck with a long skirt looks matronly. Swap those hemlines and suddenly the effect is much better. 
However, color blocking helps to break up those horizontal lines and allows a longer skirt to work. It's all about the balance. And the third factor is going to be the sleeves. Sleeves are an important styling element, but the fit and length will make or break an outfit for me. I love sleeveless dresses, especially in the summer. I just straight up don't wear sleeves once the temperature reaches a certain point. However, with color blocking in mind, I should begin to move away from spaghetti straps. Wider straps or capped sleeves will add mass and length to my torso. Capped sleeves also emphasize my shoulders, increasing the hourglass effect. When I wear short sleeves, they should be short. They should come down no further than my bust line. Puffs to widen the shoulders can work, but the cuff of the sleeve should still be fitted. Elbow length sleeves or puffy sleeves are going to be the worst on me, widening my torso without adding enough length to compensate for it. Three quarter length sleeves are a bit better, but I hate them because they're so freaking impractical. Long sleeves are an essential in the winter and can add a nice vertical line to my silhouette. Fitted knit sleeves are ideal, and with woven fabrics, a straight sleeve will be the best. Just full enough for ease of movement, but not full enough to add a necessary bulk. Okay, so I know that was a lot, but that's why I wrote it down and made a video so I can go back and rewatch it when I inevitably forget. But if I keep these factors in mind every time I begin a project, I do firmly believe that I'll be able to start making clothes that I actually like. Now, using those guidelines I just established, let's look at what my ideal daily wear wardrobe might actually look like. I've divided it into categories for summer, spring and fall, and winter. For the time being, I don't want to focus on standalone dress projects. I want more versatility and more room to mix and match. Four dresses is four dresses, but four tops and four bottoms could be up to 16 outfits. So for the tops, I'm actually still making dresses, but that's to combat my issue with the two baggy blouses and two long sweaters. For winter, I'll make knit dresses to replace my basic tops. They will be solid colors with short skirts, long sleeves, and variety in the types of necklines. For spring and fall, I'll make shirt dresses in place of blouses. They would have high necklines and be made from solids or small scale prints, so they would need to be short. They could have short or long sleeves, Short sleeves would be more flattering and last me longer into the spring, but a few long sleeve dresses would be good too. For summer tops, I've been consistently drawn in by these combos of cropped linen bodices and midi skirts. Maybe it's the simplicity and versatility that get me. Even though on the face, these bodices look like something that shouldn't work for me, I think I can make it happen. I'll just have to make the straps wider like these have to balance out the color blocking and to make sure that I always pair them with longer skirts to avoid that squatty effect. For the bottoms, I'll make heavyweight wool skirts for the winter, ranging from fingertip to knee length. I'll make lighter cotton and linen skirts for spring and fall, ranging from knee to midi length. I'll keep the skirts simple, with focus on vertical detailing, like button plackets and leg slits. And for summer, I'll make high-waisted shorts. These shorts will focus on patterns that keep things smooth over the hips and add fullness below. And there is more that I'll need for a basic wardrobe. Cardigans and sweaters and other knits for winter. I'd love to learn more about crochet and to finally overcome my completely baseless fear of knitting so that I could actually make these fit the way I want them to. Other layering pieces for spring might include jackets, blazers, and vests. These should be of versatile colors, but not matchy-matchy with my skirts. And I imagine that I'll also need to replace my basic summer knit tank tops, though I'll probably try styles with higher necklines like this. So here's a basic breakdown. It is far from a complete wardrobe, but this is the ground that I think I need to cover first, and if I do it correctly, it will still be extremely versatile between the seasonal categories. I'm gonna have to limit myself with this one. It'll be tough, but I need the practical pieces, so I will have to set aside plans for more beautiful, experimental, interesting projects until I've at least caught up a bit. I also really need to do some de-stashing. So let's see what I think I can use to get things going. First, I'll start with lightweight skirts. I think those are gonna be the most imminently useful. I've got three linens from fabricstore.com. They're all a desaturated, muted shade, and they work pretty well together. I have one yard of the plum and the olive, and then two yards of the pumpkin. Then I also have two yards of this lightweight cotton sateen, printed with my carnation design using myfabricdesigns.com. Unfortunately, their store has now closed, so I won't be able to get any more of this particular base fabric or any more custom printed fabric until I test out some new places and find a replacement. But that will make for four skirts. I'll make them all slightly different, but still basic enough to be versatile. Then I'll shift to summer tops. I have small chunks of these four fabrics, a cotton eyelet, a cotton herringbone, a cotton gauze, and a sage linen. 
They all work pretty decently with the four skirt fabrics. Also, the pumpkin linen and the carnation print should have enough left over for additional tops. Now, I don't want to go crazy with making these tops like I did a couple years ago. I want to make them one at a time and test them out before I make a million. <laughs> but if they do work, they're going to be such a great use for scrap fabric. Then I'll move on to the shirt dresses. I've got four fabrics picked out for these too. I have a light ivory cotton from Joann's with an interesting checked weave. This would be good for a very basic, simple shirt dress, matchable with all four skirts. Then I have a viscose carrot print from Mood. This fabric will only match the olive and pumpkin skirts for now, but it's a really fun print, and I'd like to make something like this with it, using a scrap of the olive linen for contrast piping. Then I have this fabric that's been in my stash for forever. It's a lightweight striped wool from Burnley and Trowbridge. I bought it years ago after seeing it in a sample set. I had no idea what I was going to do with it, but it was just so soft and beautiful, and I just couldn't pass it up. Now I think I finally have got the right project for it. A shirt dress based off of this one worn by Shirinatra. It will be matchable with the three linen skirts, but also beautiful worn on its own. I do like the boldness of her black and white stripe, but it just really isn't me. The subtle tan and white will do perfectly instead. And lastly, I've been dreaming of making a shirt dress that is basically a combination of this Shirinatra dress and this Miss Patina dress. To make it, I have this lightweight Burnley and Trowbridge wool with a subtle checked pattern. I had planned to use a wine red ribbon across the bodice, but looking at my wardrobe, this is not a very versatile option. So instead, I'll probably use this emerald green velvet ribbon, which I already have the perfect length of. For now, this dress will only really match the green linen skirt, but maybe if I eat my vegetables first, I can allow myself one slightly frivolous project. And that is probably enough for now. I know it's barely scratching the surface of a basic wardrobe, much less a complete one with all of the special dresses, outerwear, and accessories that I'd like to have with it, but this is at least 12 whole projects to make and that's plenty enough to get started with. Let's put it this way. Whenever I actually finish all 12 or finish enough that my wardrobe feels caught up and ready for other types of pieces, then maybe I'll make a part two of this video and design the rest. I'm really glad that I took this time to rethink things and try to understand the problems that I'd just not been paying enough attention to. Packaging things into a video script also helps me because it forces me to get past the brainstorming phase and keep pushing until I reach an organized conclusion. If you've had similar struggles of not being happy with your clothes or your style and not being able to figure out why, maybe using a similar strategy will help. Try writing things out. Take notes. Study the style of other people who have a similar body type. Try to find the common threads. It's not enough to watch a video like this and feel better in the moment. Or, like I've done in the past, to pull on threads until I'm satisfied, even though I never fully unraveled the mystery. Many of these style recommendations I'd already heard before, or I'd already been trying to follow intuitively. Some of them may seem stupidly obvious in retrospect. But it wasn't until I laid everything out on paper that I was able to see my own problem, which is this. I've never properly understood proportions. I was never taught it, and I never took the time to figure it out for myself. Now I feel like the path in my head is clear. It's like I was trying to get somewhere, but only using snippets of overheard information and unclear landmarks to try and find it. But now I've got a map. <laughs> I'm basically just really, really excited to get back to sewing next week. So I'll see you next time or stick around if you want a chicken update. Okay, chicken slash homesteading update, lots to tell you about. First of all, I've got a beautiful array of eggs in the incubator right now. However, it's not been doing a very good job of keeping the temperature steady, so I'm not entirely sure how well these eggs are gonna hatch. We'll just have to find out. Number two, my seedlings are looking beautiful, especially all of the little tomato plants and the cucumbers. I did finally, oh, and the Brussels sprouts. I did finally get um, some pepper plants to sprout. However, they're not growing very quickly and there's not very many of them, so I'm not sure what happened to there. And then I've seen nothing of the onions, nothing of the zucchini, and then of this whole row of herbs that I planted, only the parsley and the cilantro and the anise came up, which I really need the basil, so come on, basil. I might just have to buy one. And then outside, <sighs> it's really nice out today. So you can see our fencing project. 
We've got all of the posts put up. We've got a roll of wire. We started on the back. I don't think you can see it from here. Um, however, we had problems figuring out how to anchor the corner posts to keep the wire taut. Uh, Caleb finally figured that out with his welder. Ha <laughs> ha. We were looking into either getting a bracket kit or cementing in like heavy duty posts, but then he just figured out how to weld them in a way that worked. So we're going with the free option. Of course, gotta watch your step out here. So even though the fence isn't up, we have started letting them out during the day some. They're doing a pretty good job of staying in the boundaries. Planning on finishing up this fencing this weekend, so then they will get to run around outside every single day, all day, and they will love it. Well, hi, Turkey. Yes? Do you want pets? You want your pets? Hi, good girl. Have you been fighting with Demon Child? She's acting skittish around Demon Child. Hi! Happy birds! Hi, Turkey! What are you doing in there? Hmm? Are you gonna go play with the others? Gooses are socially awkward problem, child. <laughs> we have a stray egg. We have another stray egg. What is the deal? I think it's because the turkey's been hogging their favorite nest box. Hi, turkey! How are you feeling today? So this turkey got a pretty bad case of bumblefoot, which we've never had to deal with before, but I held her and Caleb did the surgery and she's walking better. She's still limping pretty bad, but it was before she wasn't moving at all. Like she was just staying in the same spot for days on end. So we might need to do it again if we didn't get the root of the infection out, but she is very much improved. So that's good. So I'm gonna try and tell a story. So I'm gonna try and tell a story, but I'm probably gonna get talked over a lot. So the audio is probably gonna be terrible. So on Easter morning, we went to church, and if that concerns you, just know that we have found our own church that doesn't have a lot of the fundamentalist issues that our original home church had. And there's this farmer who attends who brings baby animals for the kids to see. So we went, and I was like, can we go to the kids' classroom? And so we went, and there we had baby chickens and baby turkeys. And I got to hold a baby turkey, and it made the adorable little chirping noises. And I was like, Caleb, I want more turkeys. And he's like, no. <laughs> so after that, we went to his parents' house, and his parents have just moved recently. They finally got their dream house, which is like in a country farmhouse out in the middle of a cornfield. Finally, they got a ridiculously good deal on it, so they finally got to move out of town. And so we pull up to his parents' house, and his dad comes out to the car window and is like, hey, there's this like wild baby turkey ro roaming around our yard. And I was like, my day is made. <laughs> I jumped out of that truck before it even hit the full stop. And the other thing is, it was the first time I wore heels of the year, and I was struggling all morning. I was like tiptoeing around. And I jumped out of that truck, and I totally forgot I was wearing heels. I was just taking across, running across the grass. And so then I see the bird, and so we're chasing this bird, and it's like about this big, like a decent sized adolescent, but definitely like not fully feathered out on the head. <laughs> definitely still half a baby. And so we're chasing it around, and then Caleb is running with me, and then his brother comes out, and his dad's running, and we're trying to corner this little bird. And then we get it cornered against a, uh, a wall, and all four of us are narrowing in on it. And then it like flies at Caleb's face, and I'm like, catch it, catch it! And he's like, huh, and it like flies right through his arm. So it turned out his dad had a fishing net, so he went to go get it. But then as he was getting it, Caleb kept chasing it in circles around their house, and it started to tire out, and then he just like dove and caught it. So I took it from him, and I'm holding this little baby, and they had a cat carrier, so we put it in there, we gave it some like water and some grass and cucumbers, and you know went and did her Easter thing so then later I go out and I like I like you know tried to pet it through the cage and it made this like squeaking chirp noise and I'm like that's not a turkey 
strange. I had thought that it was some kind of heritage breed turkey because it definitely seemed domesticated. The way they found it on Easter morning is they like opened their front door and it was sitting like perched on the back of one of their like porch chairs, like, you know, just up there. And then of course it sees them and freaks out, but it didn't leave their property. It just kept like circling their house and their, their barn. So I thought it had to be domesticated because it definitely seemed comfortable with like man-made structures, but probably not raised by some, like a family with kids or anything. Probably like somebody who just, you know, has a bunch of birds out there um, because it definitely was not comfortable with human interaction. So we were Googling different types of birds. We were Googling heritage turkeys, peacocks, pheasants, and nothing seemed to like ring a bell. So they had one of their neighbors over for dessert. <laughs> who's been in the area for forever. And we were asking him if, you know, there's anybody in the area, like across the cornfield who might raise birds like this. And he's like, well, there's this one guy, you know, way down that way who has a bunch of chickens and turkeys and goats. He's the only one I can think of. So we're like, all right, maybe when we leave, we should go ask him if, you know, this is his bird. And the neighbor was like, well, I don't know, I'd be careful if I were you. And then he starts telling us stories on this guy about like, his goats were getting into the farmer's field and the farmer told him to get the goats out and he's like, get off my property, get the F off my property. And then like his dogs kept getting out and going to this neighbor's house and they were like snarling at his wife and he was going to the guy telling him to keep his dogs out. And the guy's always still just like, get off my property. And like, I, I'm sure he wasn't actually wearing like dirty long johns with, you know, the butt flap hanging open, you know, brandishing a shotgun as he said this, but that's a hundred percent the image in my head. <laughs> so me and Caleb look at each other and we're like, finders keepers maybe? <laughs> so on further inspection, comparing her to other baby bird photos online and then looking at the breeds that are actually carried locally, uh, she appears to be a guinea fowl. So that's kind of cool. I don't know. Hi, yes. Yes, you want all the attention. Sorry, she's like, she's been doing pretty well with the other birds. She's very comfortable with the chickens and the turkeys, but she's still not very comfortable with me. Um, she doesn't freak out too much as long as I'm not paying her any attention, but as soon as I do or start talking. Hey, turkey, be nice. Yeah, yeah. That's why you're stuck in here. Cause they don't know you. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, so she's gonna be in here at least until the other birds get more familiar with her. Um, but I'm kind of excited about that because I was curious about guinea fowl, but I'd never, you know, been curious enough to actually spend money on them. <laughs> but hey, free bird. <laughs> I'm gonna try not to get too attached because I've never had a guinea fowl before and I've heard they're ridiculously loud and obnoxious. So if she's too much, then we might not be able to keep her, but I don't know, I'm excited. I wanna let her out as soon as she, um, as soon as we get the fencing up so that she doesn't just go nuts and run away. Um, I don't know how well she's going to get along with the birds. Honestly, I think that turkey's, that's the one that's had the foot problem. So she's just doesn't like any of the chickens right now. She doesn't want any, any of the birds messing with her. But yeah, we'll just have to wait and see a little bit longer. But look, she's so cute. <laughs> Hello, baby. Why are you afraid of me? You should be afraid of that gigantic white bird. So yes, that has been your chicken update, plus a little bit of a story. Yeah, I'm um, hoping that the turkey is feeling better soon. All the chickens are doing quite well. Goose is being a bit ridiculous. He keeps getting in fights with Demon Child like every other day, like ridiculous cockfights. And I don't, I don't know what his deal is because he never wins, he just, but he won't leave Demon Child alone. So, I don't know. Hi, good boy. Beautiful black rooster with a floppy comb. <laughs> Anyways, this has been your chicken updates. I'll see you next time. <laughs>